This is a five-minute vote. It's the second of three votes. This bill would direct regulators to issue rules regarding swap transactions between the U.S. and foreign entities. Five-minute vote. One more five-minute vote will follow, and then general debate on the fiscal year 2014 defense authorization bill.
both the yeas are 301, the nays are 124. The bill is passed, and without objection, motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1038, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 76, H.R. 1038, a bill to provide equal treatment for utility special entities using utility operations related swaps and for other purposes. Question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. The final vote in this series on a bill debated earlier and ahead an hour of general debate on the 2014 Defense Authorization Bill, the bill that sets Pentagon programs and policies for the next year. And for a preview of that debate, we spoke earlier to a Capitol Hill reporter. Jeremy Herb, staff writer at the Hill. Uh, House lawmakers plan to spend their work week on a bill reauthorizing programs at the Defense Department. What are some of the key issues coming up in the debate? There are a lot of uh, big issues. Probably the biggest is going to be the fight over uh, sexual assault in the military and how the problem should be addressed to, to curb the number of assaults that have occurred over the past year. Uh, Congresswoman Jackie Speer has been pushing in committee and she wanted to take the decision to prosecute cases away from military commanders. Uh, that was rejected by the Armed Services Chairman, Buck McKeon, and so it's not in the bill. And that's, I think that's going to be one of your major flashpoints. It's also going to be fights over the war in Afghanistan, over a new East Coast missile site, um, and the, the total funding level of the bill as well, as the, the bill is $52 billion above the cap set by sequester. So you mentioned those spending levels and the budget caps. Uh, they're under uh, the sequester. How do, do the leaders justify changing that? Well, the, it's interesting because the Pentagon itself submitted a budget for 2014 that was 52 billion over and then the house budget and the senate budget that passed also kept it at the higher levels uh... what armed services leaders on the uh, house side say is that they want this funding they don't want sequester and so by legislating to a lower level they would be in in, in their estimation anyway encouraging the sequester to take effect and so they say this there still is time to try and stop sequester in 2014 even though there's no momentum right now on the Hill to actually do away with the cuts. What does the bill say about House Republicans' priorities? Well, I think uh, particularly missile defense is a big one that they're pushing this year. Um, they want to establish a new site on the East Coast for ground-based interceptors to try and guard against future threats against Iran. Uh, the Armed Services Committee put $140 million for the 2014 budget in that bill. You're going to see attempts this week, um, as we saw last week in committee, for Democrats to strip that out. That is probably the biggest partisan issue. Um, Republicans have also, you know, put a step forward on the importance of dealing with sexual assault. You know, McKeon, the chairman of the committee, signed off on the changes that were made. Um, and you also saw an increase of $5 billion to the amount of spending for the war in Afghanistan. And that money is going to readiness accounts that were hurt because of sequester this past year. What are Pentagon officials saying about the bill? Uh, Pentagon officials, I think, have generally been supported. They, there have been complaints because they tried to cut costs through a new round of base closures, um, new health care fees for the military health care and making a smaller raise for troops last year and the Armed Services Committee rejected all of those. Um, they say that it's not fair and they, they disagree with the Pentagon on the usefulness of base closures. Uh, the administration has put out its statement of policy and is threatening to veto the bill. It frequently does that, um, every, you know, at least over the past few years, particularly over detainee issues in Guantanamo, which is a new priority now for the president. The bill, as passed by the Republicans, bars the president from moving any detainees from Guantanamo to U.S. soil. And on the other side of the Capitol, how is the Senate bill shaping up? This week, the Senate Armed Services Committee is marking up their bill. It's a little different process because the Senate markup uh, for the full committee is mostly done in a closed session, whereas the House Committee was here until 2.15 in the morning doing their markup. Um, the Senate is opening up one section on sexual assault where you're going to see a proposal from Senator Gillibrand talked about. She's trying to take the decision to prosecute cases away from commanders. Uh, Carl Levin, the senator who's the chairman of the committee, does not agree with that. And he instead is establishing or is seeking in, in the bill to establish a review process um, for when commanders don't prosecute the cases. Jeremy Herb is a staff writer at The Hill. Appreciate your time. Thank you.
this vote, the yeas are 420. Ms. Gabbard. Ms. Gabbard votes aye. Mr. Benishat. Mr. Benishat votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 423, the nays are zero, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Without objection, the title is amended. House will be in order. If you have conversations, take them outside of the chamber. What purpose does the gentleman from California stand? Right. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all member, members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous material on H.R. 1960. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 256 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole of the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 1960. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Womack, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of Bill H.R. 1960, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2014 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction to prescribe military personnel strengths for such fiscal year and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, each will control 30 minutes. The House will be in order. Members are asked to uh, take their conversations from the floor.
Chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of H.R. 1960, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2014, which overwhelmingly passed the Committee on Armed Services. In keeping with the Committee's tradition of bipartisanship, Ranking Member Smith and I worked collaboratively to produce this bill and solicited input from each of our members. We've already adopted 169 amendments during markup and look forward to a robust debate the remainder of the week on the floor. The legislation advances our national security objectives, provides support and logistical resources for our warfighters, and helps the United States confront the national security built national security challenges of the 21st century. The bill authorizes $552.1 billion for national defense in the base budget. It also authorizes another $85.8 billion for overseas contingency operations, consistent with the House budget. And the bill contains no earmarks. Of critical importance, the bill takes serious and significant steps to end the crisis of sexual assault in our military. This includes stripping the commanders of their authority to dismiss a finding by a court-martial, prohibiting commanders from reducing guilty findings to lesser offenses, establishing minimum sentencing requirements for sexual assault, extending whistleblower protection to those who report rape, sexual assault, or other sexual misconduct, and other vital measures. Based on the years of work and oversight our committee has done on this critical issue, I share Senator Levin's reluctance to remove the commander from the decision process for crimes under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The only way to change the culture is to hold commanders responsible and accountable for their actions and decisions. Elsewhere in the bill, despite historic cuts to our armed forces, we prevent military readiness shortfalls from becoming a readiness emergency. We restore flying hours for the Army and Air Force squadrons, direct money to help reset equipment returning from Afghanistan, and relieve some of the military's maintenance backlogs. The bill also provides our warfighters with resources and authorities they need to win the war in Afghanistan and to pressure al-Qaeda and its affiliates. We fully fund a series of important authorities that support the transition in Afghanistan and U.S. national security interests. However, we prohibit the use of the majority of those funds until the Secretary of Defense certifies that U.S. priorities have been accommodated in a bilateral security agreement. We've made controlling costs a top priority. However, the mark guards against achieving false short-term savings at the expense of vital long-term strategic capabilities. For example, we prohibit the premature retirement of Navy cruisers and amphibious assault ships, critical vessels that are vital to the Pacific-focused strategy. The bill also continues investments and oversight for key systems while preserving our capacity to meet future challenges. The bill continues our care for our warfighters, veterans, and their families with the support they earned through their service, and it mandates fiscal responsibility, transparency, and accountability within the Department of Defense. The bill reduces the number of general officer billets and works to end redundancies in military headquarters and task forces. For 51 straight years, the National Defense Authorization Act has been passed and signed into law. Congress has no higher responsibility than to provide for the common defense. And with that in mind, I look forward to passing this bill for the 52nd consecutive year. And I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, yield myself four minutes. Without objection. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Chairman McKeon and the entire committee, and uh, most importantly, the staff 
It's always this time of year when our staff never sleeps um, and does an amazing job of pulling this bill together. Uh, we once again worked in a very bipartisan fashion, uh, worked the bill through the process, series of hearings, the markup last week, uh, and I thank the chairman for his excellent leadership in continuing that bipartisan tradition uh, in the hopes of, for the 52nd straight year, get, getting our bill done. Um, so I appreciate working uh, with him and with all the members of the committee and the staff. And this bill um, overall sets the right priorities, I believe. It makes sure that our military is funded, that our troops get the equipment and support that they need to carry out the missions that we ask them to do. And that is something General Dempsey says all the time. You know, we'll do whatever you ask us to do. Um, just make sure that you provide us with the resources to do it. Whatever missions we as policymakers decide the military should perform, it's our obligation to make sure that it's funded. I believe this bill does that. Uh, it particularly prioritizes special operations forces, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and the, and the kind of equipment that we will need to confront the terrorist asymmetric threats that are so central to our challenges right now on national security. And as the chairman mentioned, it also takes steps on the sexual assault problem. I will say that no piece of legislation is going to fix this. The military needs to change its culture and prioritize the protection of the men and women in our service. This, this legislation will help, certainly, but this is a huge crisis right now that the military has not yet stepped up to. I think it's one of the most important challenges that we face in national security. This piece of legislation also recognizes that we are still at war. Um, it funds the ongoing effort in Afghanistan to make sure that our troops have the support that they need to carry out that mission. Um, however, there are a couple of things in the bill um, that I am concerned about. I believe that we do need to close Guantanamo, and I have an amendment before the Rules Committee, uh, which hopefully will be made in order that will set us on a process to do that. I agree with people who say that we can't simply close it tomorrow. We need a plan. My amendment would require the President to come up with such a plan in 60 days and implement it as soon as possible. I continue to be concerned that the President has the power to indefinitely detain any person uh, captured in the United States who is designated to be an enemy combatant. That is a level of executive power that I do not think is necessary. Um, and as we have seen in recent weeks, people are growing concerned about the amount of power the executive branch has. Again, I'll have an amendment to try to change that as well. And lastly, it is worth mentioning um, sequestration. Uh, this bill is marked to a level that assumes sequestration will not happen. I think that's appropriate. Um, that's where we're at and what we have to do. Um, but it points up the challenge of sequestration. If sequestration happens, this bill is going to have to be cut by between 40 and 50 billion dollars. Where would that money come from? How would we make that work? Especially the way sequestration works, mindless across the board cuts. Because the sad truth is, that's the likely outcome. There's no pathway out of sequestration that we've seen. I thank the chairman for his leadership uh, in continually bringing home how important this is, but we haven't gotten there yet. We need to keep emphasizing that. Um, and with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the Vice Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Intelligence and Emerging Threats and Capabilities, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Thornberry. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the chairman yielding, and I think the first thing that should be said, it, it is a tremendous credit to the chairman and the ranking member that we are where we are today. It may be true that, con that uh, for 51 straight years a defense authorization bill has been signed into law, but that doesn't make it easy to do number 52. We there are still a number of complex and even some controversial issues, and so to have this bill before us today coming out of the committee on a vote uh, that is so strong, I think, is truly a credit to the leadership of, of the chairman, the ranking member, and the staff who have worked very well together. I also want to e express particular appreciation to the ranking member on our subcommittee, Mr. Langevin, because that, too, has been a partnership in dealing with a number of complex issues, including special operations, cybersecurity, science and technology, and military intelligence issues. One of the key priorities for us on this subcommittee has been oversight. 
Uh, and, and if you think back, two years ago in this bill, we instituted a quarterly reporting requirement for certain counterterrorism operations involving special operations. Last year, we have a, reporting a quarterly reporting requirement on cyber operations. And this year, in the full committee mark, is a reporting requirement involving sensitive military operations, including lethal and capture operations, that is designed uh, for oversight before, just after, and, and in a broader sense, after these events have occurred. Oversight is a critical important part of everything the committee does, especially in these complex areas. There are a number of other provisions, Mr. Chairman, dealing with military intelligence, cyber, special operations, science and technology that takes important steps forward in helping this country to, to be safer. I, I will note I find it strange the administration seems to oppose requiring the Defense Clandestine Service to focus its collection on defense priorities. That is what we require in this bill, and for some reason that gives the administration heartburn. I hope we can continue to have conversations with them about it, because it seems to me that's exactly what a defense clandestine service should, should be focused on. There are other priorities here dealing with chem bio defense and the defense Threat Reduction Agency that deals with some of the issues most in the news today. Think of Syria and other problem spots around the world. The key point, Mr. Chairman, is it's taken a lot of work to get to this point. We have a lot of amendment debate to come, but it is truly a credit to the staff, to the chairman, to the ranking member of this committee that something so important, so complex, has come to the, to the floor with such overwhelming bipartisan support. We'll have differences, but I hope and trust that it will leave the floor in the same way. I yield back. That's right. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California Reserve. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield two and a half minutes uh, to the gentlelady from California, the ranking member on the Airland Subcommittee, Ms. Sanchez. The gentleman from California is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to um, first begin by complimenting the chairman of the Tactical Air and Land Forces, uh, Chairman Mike Turner. He has uh, really been a delight to work with and uh, his steady and thoughtful leadership has really allowed us to, I believe, make a good mark in this bill. Under his leadership, the Tactical Air and Land Forces Subcommittee worked in a very bipartisan fashion, and uh, we developed a set of oversight legislation and funding recommendations that I think um, really looks at cutting waste, shaping programs, and making sure that our men and women in our military are ready to go. First, the subcommittee's portion of H.R. 1960 supports many of the high priority recommendations and desires of the President's budget. HR, for example, H.R. 1960 provides $8.1 billion for the F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter Program, $5.2 billion for Army aviation upgrades, $3.2 billion for 21 EA-18Gs and F-18 upgrades, $1.4 billion for the V-22, and $1.3 billion for the U.S. Marine Corps ground equipment. In addition, the Armed Services Committee increased funding in some parts of the DOD uh, budget that came from the President, um, where we felt that there were inadequate funds. Specifically, the bill provides an additional $400 million for the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Account and adds funding for an additional F-100 engines by $165 million, increases advanced procurement funding for 29 Navy F-18 aircraft by $75 million. Beyond these funding increases, I want to point out that we made reductions. Over $463 million worth of reductions in this funding bill. And it's never easy to reduce or to cut programs, but I think we did a very good job in making sure that as we move forward, we will have the systems that we need. And finally, H.R. 1960 includes important oversight legislation, especially for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, for the ground combat vehicle, for the individual carbine, the striker vehicle, and for body armor for our men and women of our military. All of these provisions are good governments, 
and I look forward to voting for this bill, Mr. Chairman. This time has expired. The gentleman from Washington Reserve, the gentleman from California, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Readiness, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman McKeon for his leadership, for Ranking Member Smith, for the extraordinary job that both of you gentlemen have done in bringing this bill together, bringing people together to make this happen. I also want to thank the Ranking Member of the Readiness Subcommittee, uh, Madeline Bordalia. Thank you so much for your leadership and for your cooperation to make our effort on the Readiness Subcommittee as successful as it was. Today I rise in strong support of H.R. 1960, the Fiscal Year 2014 National Defense Authorization Act. While this bill will not fix all of the nation's readiness challenges, it does go far in addressing depleted force readiness levels and associated levels of assumed risk. Specifically, the bill prohibits the Department from proposing, planning, or initiating another round of base realignment and closure Commission elements. A measure that's critical in my view given the fiscal uncertainties we face as a nation. This bill helps our military members by restoring vital readiness accounts such as the Army and Air Force flying programs, increasing funding for facility sustainment, increasing funding for Army depot maintenance and rest, increasing funding for ship depot maintenance, and prohibiting the retirement of amphibs and cruisers the Navy proposed to retire 10 to 15 years early. With successive rounds of budget cuts and the disastrous effects of sequestration, readiness rates remain at historic levels, and these levels are unacceptably low. And our warfighters are at risk, and we owe it to them to make sure that we put dollars back to make sure that readiness of our armed forces does not in any way suffer. We want to make sure that our men and women have what they need, making sure they continue to have overwhelming superiority on the battlefield. That's what this nation has always done. It's our obligation to make sure that that continues. While we've restored the Air Force and Army Flying Hours programs and bolstered facilities, sustainment, and depot maintenance, we will need to remain focused on readiness challenges in the months and years to come. And those readiness challenges will continue, especially as we retrograde from Afghanistan and reset our force. We cannot forget the need to maintain readiness. As I close, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the members of the subcommittee and the staff for their unyielding support for the men and women of our military. Our nation faces many challenges, as this bill makes clear. And I want to remind this chamber that we owe a debt of gratitude to those who selflessly serve our nation, those who volunteer to put themselves in harm's way. That's what makes our nation great. We owe them the highest amount of respect in getting this bill done in their best interest. And again, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman by the gentleman from California Reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, the ranking member on the Sea Power Subcommittee, Mr. McIntyre. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the National Defense Authorization Bill, which the Armed Services Committee passed last week with overwhelming support, and thank my colleagues, Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith, for their hard work in making sure this bipartisan measure would be done the right way and to help our men and women in uniform. Specifically, I'm pleased that this bill strengthens our national defense, supports North Carolina military bases with a $355 million investment in military construction, and makes key investments across the nation to help make sure that our servicemen and women have the tools they need to do their job. This measure authorized $552 billion for national defense spending and $885.8 billion for overseas contingency operations. It also, in supporting current law, which mandates an automatic 1.8 percent annual increase in troop pay and rejects proposals to increase some TRICARE fees or establish new TRICARE fees, which many service members and veterans have long been concerned about. I'm also pleased this committee made sexual assault prevention and prosecution a cornerstone of this legislation. And I'm particularly pleased that this bill includes an amendment authored by my good friend and colleague across the aisle, Representative Walter Jones, a fellow North Carolinian, to protect the religious freedom of military chaplains to be able to close a prayer according to the dictates of their conscience and faith and training. 
The committee also included an important provision that Representative Jones and I both worked together on to require periodic audits of Berry Amendment contracting compliance by the DOD Inspector General. And I can tell you as ranking member of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee, I would like to thank my colleague Chairman Randy Forbes for his work on our section of this bill. The Sea Power portion of the bill carefully cuts waste in some programs while also improving Congress's ability to oversee the DOD. It includes provisions for the Gerald Ford class aircraft carrier, multi-year procurement language for E2D and C-130J aircraft, and several other provisions that provide additional oversight of important programs, including two of the Navy's largest unmanned aircraft programs. It also gives the DOD permission to begin retirement of some old KC-135 refueling aircraft that have been in storage for many years. And with the new tanker program, the KC-46A coming online, it's on cost and on schedule, two phrases that we love to hear not only in the committee, but also on behalf of our taxpayers. I'm glad we're giving DOD more flexibility in these tough budget times to manage its inventory of aircraft. Also, the Sea Power, sea power portion has $14.3 billion for shipbuilding that would authorize a total of eight new ships. It authorizes $934 million of ship construction funding to ensure that the Virginia-class submarine, DDG-1000-class destroyer, DDG-51-class destroyer, and joint high-speed vessel programs stay on schedule. And with regard to the aircraft programs, this bill fully funds the administration's request for all major aircraft programs in our jurisdiction, including the Air Force's new bomber program. The sea power portion of this budget, being on budget and on time, is something I know that we all can support. And it's clear that this entire bill is one that has strong bipartisan support, and I urge my colleagues to support the gentleman's it. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman Thank from you, Washington sir. Reserve, reserves, the gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Military Personnel, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. The military personnel provisions of H.R. 1960 are the product of an open bipartisan process. H.R. 1960 provides our war fighters, veterans, and military families the care and support they need, deserve, and have earned. Specifically, this year's proposal reforms the way the Department of Defense must address sexual assault in the Uniform Code of Military Justice and provides significant additional support, especially in the form of dedicated legal assistance and whistleblower protection to victims of this terrible crime. In addition, the mark would support the services requested in strength while ensuring the Army and Marine Corps adhere to the limitation on reductions mandated in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2013. It reaffirms the committee's commitment to the operational reserves by requiring minimum notification before deployment or cancellation of deployment and provides authority to improve the personal, personnel readiness of the National Guard. This also requires the Secretary of Defense to review and make improvements to the integrated disability evaluation system for members of the reserve components and further authorizes transitional compensation and other benefits for dependents of a service member who is separated from the armed forces because of a court-martial and forfeits all pay and benefits. This does not include the request for military retirees to pay more for health care. In conclusion, I want to thank Ms. Davis and her staff for their contributions in support of this process. I particularly appreciate the active, informed, and dedicated subcommittee members supported by the professional staff. Their recommendations and priorities are clearly reflected in the Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2014. I urge all my colleagues to support this bill. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California Reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield three minutes uh, to the gentleman from California, Ms. Davis, the ranking member of the Personnel Subcommittee. The gentleman from California is recognized for three thank minutes. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleagues on the committee for working together to bring forward a good bill. My thanks, of course, to Chairman Wilson and the committee staff for working in a bipartisan manner. The bill contains a multitude of provisions to address the issue of sexual assault. And while it may seem that this year Congress focused on sexual assault in the military, the reality is 
that this committee and its members have been working hard to address this issue that demands our attention for the last several years. And this committee has once again put forward a number of proposals. But as much as we would wish that legislation alone will not stop someone from committing a sexual act, we know that is not the case. It will not stop either the fear of retaliation, which prevents a number of service members from reporting a sexual assault. This problem and how we deal with it has to start and end with those who wear the uniform. But it is important that we provide them the tools they need to effectively change the system and ultimately the culture by holding perpetrators accountable and commanders and prosecutors to the highest standard, whether through bystander intervention, command climates that do not tolerate or condone sexual harassment and innuendo, and appropriate prosecutions and command actions, our service members are ultimately the change agents that need to step forward. This bill also focuses on the dependents and families who have also sacrificed so much and are the backbone of support for our service members over a decade of war. Military families also bear the scars of war and many need help as well. I'm pleased that the bill includes a number of provisions to support families, including a provision that seeks to track the number of defendants that have taken their own lives by suicide. While the number of suicides for active duty members has increased, we have heard anecdotal evidence that the same holds true for dependents. And the bill seeks to determine if the services can begin to track these individuals as well so that we can determine the best course of action to also address this critical problem. Included are several provisions to address uh, the reserve components, the reserve components, including a requirement that members of the re reserve be provided at least 120 days notification of their deployment. We have been in conflict for more than a decade, and it's a time that the services ensure that when individuals and units are called to deploy or if their orders are canceled, they have adequate time to prepare. I would like to mention, Mr. Speaker, though, that there is one provision which I think could adversely impact the morale, well-being, and good order and discipline of the force. It is a provision that extends protections to actions and speech of service members. And in essence, this provision protects an individual who engages in hateful or discriminatory speech or action. I yield the gentlelady in the, I yield the gentlelady an additional 30 seconds. The gentlelady is and uh, and recognized a, and a for commander and that a commander may take action only when actual harm occurs. So if this language becomes law, a service member could engage in such speech and action for as long and as much as desired, and a commander could only act against the individual when, say, the first shot was taken. I don't believe that was the author's intent, but I do believe that the language is currently written could be made to understand in that fashion. So while I have some concerns with the provisions in the bill, the overall bill provides many benefits to our troops and their families, and I urge my colleagues to support it. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Washington Reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield uh, three minutes to my friend and colleague, the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Tactical Air and Land Forces, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'm here today to speak in uh, favor of the National Defense Authorization Act, and I'm very privileged to serve as the chairman of the Tactical Air and Land Forces Subcommittee. I first want to begin by thanking Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith uh, for their support for the provisions in the bill uh, who, that uh, go to address the important issue of uh, sexual assault in the military. Um, Ms. Sangas and I were tasked by the ranking member and the chairman to come up with a bipartisan solution. We worked directly with the staff of both the ranking member and the chair, and uh, we believe that we have put provisions in this bill with the full support of um, on a bipartisan support of the committee that will end the re-victimization of the victim. We have a problem of sexual assault in the military, and that problem is that the perpetrators feel safe and the victims feel insecure and re-victimized. Uh, this uh, bill includes provisions of the Turner Zongas Be Safe Act. It also includes provisions from Representative of Heck, Wolorski, uh, Noam, Castro, Sanchez, and Duckworth. 
Uh, basically, this bill will strip commanders of their authority to dismiss a conviction for a serious offense by a court martial and significantly limits the commander's ability to modify or dismiss the sentence determined by a court martial. But we go even beyond that. This bill says if you commit a sexual assault, you are out. If you um, have an inappropriate relationship between a trainer and a trainee, you are out. Uh, no longer will it be tolerated for someone to commit a sexual assault and stay in the military. No longer will a victim ever have to passionately tell in a hearing before Congress that they were forced to salute someone who had committed a sexual assault against them. Uh, we also ask uh, for the uh, Department of Defense to convene an independent panel with uh, reviewing all of the Uniform Code of Military Justice as it applies to sexual assaults so that we can see if there are additional provisions and uh, reforms that need to be enacted. I want to thank my ranking member, Lourdes Sanchez, on the Air and, and Land Forces uh, Tactical Subcommittee. Uh, we have worked together to make a priority serving our men and women in, in uniform in the areas of Afghanistan. Also, we've added over $1.3 billion in the President's budget that was requested uh, to be authorized to address urgent operational needs for the warfighter, including counter-improvised explosive device requirements. Uh, the bill also includes uh, support for the production in our nation's heavy armored vehicle industrial base by maintaining minimum uh, sustained production of upgrade modifications for the Abram tanks and heavy improved recovery vehicles. Uh, the, Air, the committee bill also retains the Air Force's Global Hawk Block 30 unmanned, in, unmanned intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft to support the deployed warfighter rather than placing these aircraft in storage as the Air Force planned to do. Uh, the committee's bill also addresses the critical need to reduce the weight of individual warfighter equipment, improve acquisition practices used for this gear, and requires the Secretary of Defense to assess options for providing personnel protection equipment specifically fitted for the female warfighter. Uh, our uh, subcommittee is very proud to look in all of our aspects in ways that we can support the warfighter. And again, I want to thank uh, the chair and the ranking member for their steadfast support uh, for addressing the epidemic issue that we have of sexual assault in the military. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman from California Reserves, gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield three minutes uh, to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, um, who is the ranking member on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of uh, the work of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. I would particularly like to thank Chairman Rogers for his friendship and bipartisan leadership, and as well as all the members of the subcommittee. I support the many provisions of the bill that strengthen our national security. The bill, for example, maintains a safe, secure, and reliable nuclear arsenal while improving effective oversight of the National Nuclear Security Administration, cost, cost assessments efforts, and planning. The bill supports nuclear nonproliferation efforts, including an increase of $23 million to reduce the risk of nuclear terrorism and the spread of nuclear weapons. The bill increases funding for regional missile defense assets to protect our deployed forces and allies, including important cooperation with Israel against short and medium range missile threats. The bill authorizes defense environmental cleanup activities, and finally the bill supports investments in military and space assets. However, I also should report that I do have reservations about several provisions of the bill that I, in my opinion, undermine national security and waste taxpayer dollars. For example, the bill blocks prudent nuclear weapons reductions, including New START reductions, which would strengthen st strategic stability. The bill increases funding for nuclear weapons by $220 million over the President's already generous budget request. The bill um, accelerates the funding of ground-based mid-course defense program spending by nearly $250 million and jumps to conclusions about East Coast missile defense sites against the best military advice of our generals. And finally, the bill changes NNSA health and safety oversight, undermining independent oversight of defense nuclear sites related to worker and public protection, as well as increasing the Secretary of Energy's authority to fire employees without due process. I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to debating the merits of these and other provisions of the bill. I thank my friend and colleague from Washington State for yielding the time. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from Washington Reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the chairman of the subcommittee on strategic forces, the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized for three minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, uh, 
Mr. Speaker, as chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, I rise in support of H.R. 1960, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2014. It's important to understand what this bill does and why it deserves our support. For example, it streamlines the acquisition of 14 ground-based interceptors announced by the Secretary of Defense on March 15th, saving the taxpayer hundreds of millions of dollars. It ensures that uh, strategic uh, competitors do not gain inadvertent access to vital systems or information because of reliance on commercial sitcom providers. It prohibits the transfer of some missile defense technology to Russia and strengthens congressional oversight of administration efforts with regard to U.S.-Russia missile defense cooperation generally. It invests in proven and vital systems like Iron Dome and short-range rocket defense systems. It provides significant resources for uh, above the President's request for other Israeli cooperative missile defense programs like Arrow 2, Arrow 3, and David Sling's weapon systems. Force it, force it, it forces efficiencies and prioritization of critical nuclear modernization programs in the budget of the National Nuclear Security Administration, and it implements several initiatives to improve security at the National Nuclear Security Administration and NSA. Uh, and it streamlines uh, the process to terminate DOE employees negligent in their duties at Category 1 nuclear material sites like the Y-12 site. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the full committee chairman, Buck McKeon, for his leadership this year. Without him, this process would not have worked nearly as well. And I also want to thank my friend and colleague, the ranking member from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, who has been a great partner in this process. I urge all of my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield three minutes to the gentlelady from Guam, Ms. Berdayo, uh, who is the ranking member on the Readiness Subcommittee. The gentlewoman from Guam is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I um, want to stay at the onset that I've enjoyed very much working in a bipartisan manner with the chairman of the Readiness Subcommittee, Mr. Rob Whitman. Uh, also the chair of the full committee, Mr. McKeon, and the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Adam Smith. And I want to thank also the committee and professional staff for the many long hours that they've uh, put into getting this bill ready. I rise in strong support of H.R. 1960. This bill works to ensure that our men and women in uniform are well trained and equipped to defend our nation and its allies. Although this bill represents the hard work and efforts of both the majority and the minority, I want to highlight the need to resolve sequestration. I hope that this Congress undertakes serious efforts to finally fix sequestration with a comprehensive solution. We can avoid this problem. I would like to highlight a few important readiness issues. The bill provides a one-year extension of authority for certain pay and benefits to civilian personnel who are forward deployed, performing critical operations overseas and in combat zones. We are also requiring GAO to look into how the furloughs of civilian employees are being implemented by the Department of Defense to ensure they are implemented in a fair and equitable manner and to understand the impact on mission execution. The bill addresses sustainment issues for two important procurement programs, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and the LCS. We must understand that the costs associated with the sustainment of these programs over the long term to make informed decisions about the future of these programs. The bill also contains a provision that will close loopholes that allow MSC and Navy to repair an increasing number of ships overseas. And I'm especially pleased to note that this bill puts real resources into the rebalance of our military toward the Asia-Pacific region. The bill takes a common-sense approach and rolls back restrictive language that hampers the obligation and the expenditure of the Government of Japan funds, which is positive for our bilateral relationship with the Government of Japan. The bill conti continues the House's consistent position of support, the realignment of forces in this region. We also... An additional minute. The gentleman is recognized for an additional minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We also provide funding for the LSC, continued development of the next generation long range strike bomber, and robust procurement of Virginia class submarines, all assets that are important to our rebalance to the Asia Pacific region. However, 
I am concerned about Section 233 in the underlying bill. I appreciate the intent of this provision. We do need to ensure the defense of our allies in East Asia, yet this provision unduly restricts our combatant commanders from providing support to emerging threats or supporting other allies in other areas. The provision is unnecessary and it impacts our military readiness and I hope that the Rules Committee will make my amendment in order to improve the provision. And again, I thank my colleagues and I urge all my colleagues to support this vitally important bill. And I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Washington Reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield three minutes to my friend and colleague, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Sea Power and Protection Forces, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Forbes. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2014. With Chairman McKeon's and Ranking Member Smith's leadership, I believe that this bill provides the right authorities and sufficient resources to demonstrate our resounding and unequivocal support for the men and women who place their service to country above all things. I think we could all learn from their service and devotion. As to the Sea Power and Projection Forces subcommittee, Mark, I continue to be concerned about both the size and composition of our Navy's fleet. In the 30-year shipbuilding plan, the administration has indicated a requirement of 306 ships. The 2010 QDR independent panel indicated a requirement of 346 ships. Unfortunately, the Navy has proposed a reduction of the fleet to 270 ships in just the next year. Various outside experts have indicated that if we continue to support our current level of shipbuilding investments, the fleet could be reduced further to just 240 ships. This path is simply unacceptable. Given the budget cuts of the past four years, which I opposed, I think this bill does a good job of reversing some of these negative trends and takes a step in the right direction by authorizing eight combat ships and ensuring that we retain and modernize our current fleet to the end of their service life. I remain very pleased with the direction of our projection forces. This bill provides strategic air force investments in terms of both the KC-46A tanker program and the long-range striker bomber. These are critical capabilities that need to be nurtured carefully. This mark also includes important cost-saving initiatives that provide the Navy and Air Force with the ability to procure E-2D Hawkeye and C-138 Super Hercules aircraft using multi-year procurement authority. These legislative provisions alone are projected to save taxpayers over $1 billion. As I look to the future, I believe that it's essential to ensure strategy drives our debate. Mr. Chairman, I hope that uh, we've gone a long ways to reverse some of these negative trends. I think this bill does a good job of supporting our forces, and I would urge my colleagues to support this bill. I thank my colleague and friend Mike McIntyre, my ranking member, and our hardworking staff for their efforts in producing this bill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California Reserves, the gentleman from Washington, is recognized. G could you, uh, Mr. Chairman, please let us know how much time is left? Okay. The gentleman from Washington has 12 and a half minutes. The gentleman from California has 11. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield three minutes to the gentlelady from Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Songus, who's the ranking member on the Oversight and Investigation Committee and also has done uh, fabulous work on the uh, sexual assault legislation contained in this bill. The gentlelady from Massachusetts recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this